Hello, welcome to TSC Talks, the podcast inspired by the condition known as tuberous sclerosis complex, which causes benign tumors to grow in all the major organs of the body. This podcast is for those directly affected, parents, caregivers, anyone who's ever struggled to make sense of unimaginable circumstances and find a way. My name is Jill Woodworth and I am your host. Buckle up, we're going for a ride outside the box, off the grid, down many a rabbit hole and back as we wrangle a way to case manage and stay sane. Talk about it, compare notes, find the experts, pick their brains. No magic bullet, but we are not alone. Hello, thank you so much for tuning in. My guest coming up is Nikki Lolly. Nikki is a former pediatric nurse. She was working as a pediatric nurse in October 2016 when she suffered a traumatic brain injury on the job and developed debilitating symptoms after the injury, which she you know, didn't realize right away was quite as severe as it ended up being, suffered cognitive issues, chronic headaches, and neck pain, sought relief or sought treatment all over the place, tried, you know, everything possible that she could investigate and research. Kind of was at the end of her rope and she was in Vegas on a trip with her husband at the, you know, feeling like she was at the bottom, looked out of her window in the hotel room and saw a sign from God or somebody saying uh, you could get your medical marijuana card. So she was like, well, I guess I've tried everything and I'm going to try that. And she did and was able to find a strain that offered her some relief, bringing the chronic pain down from seven to 10 to more tolerable uh, two and three. So this is her story. I feel personally connected to the TBI uh, experience, having had a father who had a TBI in the military where he paratrooper jumped out of a plane and his parachute didn't open. He rode other people's parachutes down, ended up falling on his head and was in a coma and, you know, not thought to be able to survive and ended up, you know, bouncing back. But there was not a lot of knowledge about the long term impacts of that type of uh, head trauma back when he had it in the uh, 1950s. So and and then he went back and played football uh, center. So sustained more, ended up developing early dementia uh, in his 50s and passed away in his 60s from frontotemporal temporal dimension. So personally connected to this story and love talking to Nikki. She's just a bundle of energy. It was a blackjack dealer, which I found really fascinating. So I'm going to stop talking here and I'll let Nikki talk. Thanks for tuning in. Keep tuning in. I hope you enjoyed or uh, got something out of Daniel. Daniel was wonderful. Really laying it out there from his lived experience managing a TSC diagnosis, among other things. So lots more coming up and I'm going to stop talking. Thanks for, t- yeah, I said that. Take it away, Nikki. I'm so grateful to have Nikki Lawley on the podcast today. Hi, Nikki. Hi, Jill. <laughs> she is from Buffalo, New York, and she's here to talk about her life and her experience with a, a traumatic brain injury. She had not in a like road really dramatic way, but in an accident and in a doctor's office when she was helping a kid. And I met her through Mike Robinson when Mike shared her story about this, having a traumatic brain injury and seeking, you know, treatment after treatment, trying to get people to believe her. She was having terrible migraines and she'll talk about it if I, so yeah, so I was just like, I read her post and I thought about my father um, who had a traumatic brain injury and you know, he didn't find cannabis. He was very anti-drugs. And for a lot of re- good reasons, he was kind of reefer madness type coming out of that. So um, when I heard Nikki's story, I, I thought, yeah, you know, that's so interesting that she's found some relief through cannabis. It, this has led her on quite a journey within the cannabis industry itself. And she's learned a lot and she's, she's an advocate and she is all kinds of things that she's going to share. So, um, Nikki, why don't you uh, introduce yourself? Tell me a little bit about your life. 
Well, thanks, Jill, for welcoming sure. me to your podcast. Sure. I am a 49-year-old woman that found herself in a unique situation that I had never expected or planned for. When I was working just one normal day, uh, everything changed, and this was in October of 2016. My background is I have had a wide variety of careers throughout my 49 years here. I have two grown children that are 28 and 30, and I worked really hard all my life. I started my career in retail, being everything from a pet counselor to a uh, medical assistant in a doctor's office. I grew up in Buffalo, New York. And then I relocated to Fort Myers, Florida through my early adult, late teen years, and then relocated back to Buffalo. That change, obviously, it was new for me because as an adult versus being an adolescent, you don't know where to drive and what to do and all those great things. So becoming familiar with a new city and new place and new things. When I got to Buffalo, though, I discovered I couldn't do the job that I'd always done in Florida, which was medical assisting in a pediatric office. In Florida, there's different laws and regulations uh -huh. that basically you have to be a licensed professional in New York State, where in Florida, you practice under the actual physician's license. Uh -huh. So when I came to New York, I'm like, well, what am I going to do for yeah. a job? So <laughs> I had to go back to school. And I did so, um, I did an accelerated LPN program. And when I started practicing nursing right after school, I noticed a lot of physicians didn't seem to have the same passion and compassion that I did just coming out of nursing school. And the first job I had, it really went south quite fast once I discovered lab results and uh. communicating with patients and being allergic to a medication, yet we prescribed that same medication to the patient, like this was happening every day. What did you, and, just, just pause you for a minute, what did you, like, when you found that out, I mean, how did you carry that information? I was incredibly upset. Yeah. I would go home from work every day and be like, what if this was my father or grandfather? And so that's when... I then discovered, well, maybe I should do pharmaceutical sales. I really like this medical stuff, but, mm -hmm. you know, I've done sales for so long in retail. Maybe I'll go back to that. <laughs> and after I started interviewing with major pharmaceutical mm -hmm. companies, and all of them loved my background, but they all said the same thing. You don't have any outside sales experience. Uh -huh. We don't care if you sell mobile phones. We don't care if you sell, you know, <laughs> insurance. Just sell something and come back to us in two years. <laughs> it's kind of yeah. like, Okay, so I just found this crazy job selling commercial HVAC air filters. It was a huge right. company out of Louisville, Kentucky. And honestly, I think they just had kind of a quota to fill <laughs> of, women, <laughs> of women people. So I can talk with the boys and play with the best of them at that time. And yeah. so it, I made the job fun. Uh -huh. I really enjoyed it. And then... I kind of was like, well, maybe I won't go into pharmaceuticals. This is kind of fun. Uh -huh. I then had the opportunity to work for a company out of Canada. They were an air filter manufacturer, and they offered me a crazy position to take over total filter management for a very large manufacturing facility. So I had a whole new thing to learn, and now I was traveling pretty much five days a week. I had wow. a very, very busy life at that point. My 30s were that of a working girl. Then what basically happened was the economy changed quite a bit. And the company that I was working with actually sold their company to the U.S. So I was offered a position, but I had been telling my prior air filter customers that I'd be opening my own company and I'd be a woman-owned business. And so I ended up starting Total Filtration Solutions, which became a woman-owned business. And it was going quite well, quite successful, until one of my largest contractors, um, when you're a woman-owned business, you can do these pass-through things that basically it's very, very low margin. But as a contractor to meet a federal requirement, you have uh -huh. to put so much business through a minority company, a woman-owned company. They have certain mandates that they uh -huh. have to do. So I was that woman-owned company 
and on the hook for a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar killer. Oh my goodness! Well, my contractor, that was my customer, filed bankruptcy, and so oh, Total boy. Filtration Solutions was still on the hook for doing, you know, the pass through job. And I issued a purchase order to a manufacturer who made this killer, and they expect to be paid. Uh, Eventually, they do get paid via insurance and nightmares, but it was an incredibly challenging time, sounds stressful. to say the least. But I found a contractor locally that seemed very interested in working with us and helping uh-huh. us out. And I ended up giving my employees my inventory, my treat secrets, my everything to this uh-huh. company. And uh, in the end, six months after I gave them all these things and my employees and all my customers, they said, yeah, we don't need you anymore. Wow. So yeah. I was unemployed and licking my wounds and feeling pretty sad. During that time, yeah, I, I took a, a okay. dealing course for a casino. So I graduated from the dealing school and the casino locally here had a total hiring freeze. So I actually didn't get a phone call for three years to go be a dealer. So I had an audition. It was crazy that I passed the audition. and I had already accepted a position as an LPN again uh-huh. while I was, you know, waiting for the casino to call, which took so long. Yeah. I took a position working for a Planned Parenthood pediatric clinic. Yes, Planned Parenthood does take care of children. I really loved my job. It was working with some of um, Western New York's lower income, uh, lower resources, hmm. very impoverished sure. communities. Mm-hmm. I learned compassion and, you know, you just had fun with it. And I really enjoyed my job. And I, I really felt like I made a difference when I worked there. For seven years, I actually worked as a pediatric nurse and as a dealer at the same time. I loved both jobs. So about seven years after I started at the casino, my health became sort of a challenge. I found that I was struggling to breathe, walk upstairs. Um, it was a full-on smoking casino, but truly the health effects were just about killed me. I didn't want to leave because the income was great. So uh, after going to one job, I then was working for a different pediatric office, complete 360, very upper middle-class patient population, a whole 360 career change. So working at this office, cool, it's just regular hours, just one job. I actually had a life and weekends and all that stuff. I had worked for the company that I got hurt at for five years. Uh-huh. And so like having heard all that, you get kind of a sense that, you know, I worked hard all my life. Yeah. And I wasn't a big takeoff for sick things or anything like that. So then basically I was working one day. It was a 12-hour day for me, and the day was just like any other. So this day, um, I was scheduled to go on my lunch break at 5 p.m. because then I worked the night shift. So one of our other, my coworkers came out and said, this kid is, like, out of control. Can you come help me? Uh-huh. Can somebody come help me hold? So I put my purse down and threw it. And Aren't you? Uh, right some, back like, you're not a huge individual, right? No, I'm like 4'11 and a half, 105 pounds. Just want to clarify that. And my coworker was probably 105 pounds and like 4'8. And this kid was not like a special needs child. This kid was just getting his routine tetanus booster for school. And I could hear the commotion and the negotiating. And this was not my first rodeo. So (laughs) I only have 20 minutes for break. So this is cutting into my time now. <laughs> so yeah, I went yeah. in there with full on authority rather than <laughs> a negotiator. There was no yeah. negotiating at this point. It had been done. So this child was absolutely out of control. So um, I basically have the father grab the kid. He's 10. He's about 85, 90 pounds mm-hmm. and roughly 5'2". And basically I had the dad put the kid on his lap and crisscross the kid's arms in front of him. I go behind the father and the kid, and I then secure that arm with all my might. Mm-hmm. The, mm-hmm. the kid's both arms behind him, and I basically am restraining him. And the kid, completely out of nowhere, 
tucks his chin and flips it back into my forehead. <sighs> and so he bashes me. I saw stars. I saw nothing, blackness. And I hit the plaster wall behind me. And then I hit the head, head, head again when it, it was like a double impact uh-huh. back and forth. Like a, like, yeah. Oh, yes, boy. a true whiplash motion. Literally everything stopped in time. And um, the physician assistant from the next room comes running over. And he goes, what was that? And he <sighs> said, that was Nikki's head. But the biggest thing I noticed at that minute was my left arm was just so weak and felt like pins and needles. It felt like you hit your funny bone, but it was just not a normal thing. And uh-huh. I knew something. Oh, that must have been just terrifying. So basically the kid gets a shot with the physician assistant sitting on top of him, me sitting yeah. on top of the physician assistant. And I fly out to go grab my little takeout. I grab my food. I come back. I woof it down. I all of a sudden I'm super dizzy. I'm super hot. Um, my vision's blurry. I go yak in the bathroom and I literally uh, tell my coworker, something's not right, dude. Yeah. And um, the physician that was on took a look at me and said, uh, yeah, you got a concussion. And I said, well, why is my arm all jacked up? Well, maybe something happened to your neck too. And so again, I wasn't really focused on the head injury aspect, uh-huh. concussion aspect. Sure. It was really freaking me out about my arm. So I go to the urgent care. They say, yes, cervical strain and, you know, closed head injury. Now, this is my third documented closed head injury. This Your one. third? And, yes, one was a uh, crash into a metal desk frontally. I dropped something and just moved too fast and lost my balance and hit a, the corner of a metal desk. And I ended up having to go to the ear for that one. Again, closed head injury, nothing lasting. I didn't feel good for a few days, but then it was fine. So then the next head injury was in 2015 when I um, slipped on ice in my driveway and hit the back of my head. Oh my goodness. I again, you know, the ER and same thing, closed head injury, rest, loss. It did seem to take me a little longer to recover from that, but Mm -hmm. again, with my lifestyle, you know, it's just busy. You can't let a little headache get in the way. Mm -hmm. But this one was completely different. And I expected to be out a day, maybe two, definitely not three plus years. (laughs) And when I say I could not cognitively function, I could not stop the head pain. I literally cried for the first year (laughs) after my injury so often because I just, I tried <sighs> so many different medications and yeah. so many treatments failed and people start Wait, like, questioning, well, it can't be from the concussion. Really? That you're still suffering. Well, this yeah, was like, how, how long, well, how many years ago? 10, 11, 16, so three plus. Well, you know, it's only, it's really becoming more like mainstream now, the like traumatic brain injury. Understanding of it. Yeah. 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 So yeah. even that's interesting because even three, four years ago, it was people were questioning that that I'm, could. Oh, I'm telling you, they were really questioning it. I spent over $52,000 of my own money going for various diagnostic testing, going to different hospitals, uh-huh. everything from the NYU concussion center to very exclusive kind of uh, brain imaging and testing with a chiropractor in outside of New York City. And I mean, huh. I have gone in Canada for neuropsych evals. I have gone Florida for numerous consults. Now, did you learn anything from these visits? I have. I have true cervical instability at my top two vertebrae. Um, The ligaments from the injury, like our level three damage, level four is in half and your head basically has no strength. (laughs) So two of my ligaments are completely level three. Um, in the front, and they really cause a huge amount of issues as far as, like, um, I get no cerebral spinal fluid, CSF flow to my frontal parts of my brain. Oh, wow. Because of the way the bones are, and again, I'm I'm not a chiropractor, and sure. forgive my lack of layman's <laughs> I'm not either, terms so. here, but, <laughs> but basically, yeah. um, it causes complete compression and occlusion of the CSF world. 
and it's like even my practice is like well what the neurosurgeons say oh you don't need surgery well why aren't you back to work and and I constantly felt like I had to tell people my side of the story like I'm not crazy people there's something really wrong (laughs) like Uh. it is not normal to never not have a headache so one of the biggest things that devastated me probably the most of my cognitive challenges was I can't count anymore. When I worked at the casino, I emptied a deck of cards so fast with blackjack and I could count like backwards. It was just never a challenge. I cannot count higher consistently than five. Really? Yes. The example of that was my family came to town for the holiday mm-hmm. and the first year and they all wanted to play rummy and i'm like sure let's play rummy it was my turn to deal the cards i couldn't do it i mean this is my family this is no pressure this is like yeah you know and i was having a good time up until that so my mom hands me the deck of cards and the dealer can't deal not, i can't deal it just sucks that was like when I'm realizing, what am I ever going to do in my life? I oh mean, like, my goodness. is yeah. this really permanent? And this was just two months after the injury, but I began like to things had been stripped hole. away from you. You know, like you just are resilient as, f- and you just keep going. So yeah, so then so it, you hit so the low I, point. I hit a pretty low point. I mean, I was pretty devastated, and I had smoked pot before. Sure. Um, While working at the casino, you know, I'm talking, I was a social smoker, not every day by any means, but Uh several times a week. Yeah. yeah. Um, But but again, I knew what it was. I got it. I got it from a dude down the street and, you know, we. (laughs) That's the way it was done. Yeah. I mean, I know what it's called. I didn't know what a terpene was and I sure (laughs) as hell didn't know what antivoids were. Like, what's that? Once I discovered it wasn't just hot, it was like huge. Now, with my cognitive challenges, I can't read long articles. I can't read books. I can't do a lot of things that way. But if I read the same thing 20 times, usually part of it will stick. I tend to get mixed up with a lot of things. Executive function is a major challenge. So I got a gift from my husband uh, to go to the Cosmopolitan Hotel in Vegas Mm -hmm. for Christmas. And... I wasn't really looking forward to it. I got to tell you now, hearing my history, the things I enjoyed doing the most were going to the casino, going to shows, going to plays, going to concerts. And so for me not to like be super pumped about going to Vegas, I just, I didn't know how I was going to be reacting on the flight. I didn't know what. You couldn't predict, you know, that you would have the the capacity, you know, you needed that emotional energy. and, And it, so yeah, I can see why that wouldn't sound fun at all. No, it just didn't. And Mm -hmm. yet I wanted to be excited for him. And, you know, my husband's been my rock, like, since 1996. Oh, that's good. We got married in 08, but we've been together since 96. So, you know, he's the dad my kids have known. He's the one who has supported and seen my entire life unfold. So I'm saying, yeah, I've got to suck it up and make this work. So we go to the airport and I'm on all these antidepressants. They had me on Cymbalta, which is probably the worst drug on the planet for me. Anyway. Yeah, I, I, um, oh. and I just I started have a having, real bias about psych meds. You know, I know they're, they're uh, tools and, you know, I think they're necessary. They're, they're easily misused, I guess, by doctors. Well, I had doctors literally throwing drugs at me. Every time I went to him, well, try this, try that. Yeah. I was having massive allergic reactions <sighs> to so many of these drugs. And the drug reactions were, in some cases, like closing my throat as well. Like, oh through goodness. anaphylaxis. Wow. So yeah. It's like, you're afraid to take some of it, right? But yet, you feel so sh- like, so sh- yeah. that you don't even want to get out of bed. Like, yeah. I am the chick who, you just heard that then this energetic ball of fire who can't even get out of bed how did (laughs) your family handle that you know your husband didn't handle it well yeah i mean they didn't early on well Um, yeah it's hard those things are like an adjustment and yeah well none of us really understood right like why the hell isn't mom getting better why is mom getting so bad like my daughter on christmas 
tried to shake some sense into me and said, Mom, nobody's going to fix this but you. You cannot stay sad. You've got to snap out of it. And I mean, this is my daughter yeah. telling me this. That's yeah. 25 years old, right? Yeah. And it really, she said, I love you, but I don't know how to help you. Yeah. And just like you couldn't help me years ago, I had to help myself. You've got to find a way to help yourself. You've got to get out of this. And so that made me more sad, right? Tough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I always remember that talk. I remember it to this minute. I remember sitting in my bathroom, sobbing my eyes out. With well, you couldn't it. explain it to her how in a way that she would understand. So that's like you had to almost just accept that she was going to misunderstand and just go forward. That's not easy. Yeah. It's definitely different, right? Yeah. But I mean, man, she really stepped up and tried. Jack tried, my husband, but his efforts were more of that of almost a father to a child. <laughs> it was just, I probably needed that level of coaching, if you will, but it wasn't working. It would just cause more resentment, more mm -hmm. feelings of failure. Ugh. So we go to Vegas and now this is not my first rodeo to race Vegas at all. Um, so I, I gather. Go like two or two to four times a year, mm -hmm. we would go just for like three, four days. For fun. Yep. Serious. But, and so I always request the highest floor overlooking the Bellagio fountains in Vegas, which are these beautiful waterfall fountains mm -hmm. that play music. And, and it's just amazing. So on this particular day, that was the room that I had reserved, but it wasn't ready. When we landed from that airport, I just thought I was going to die. Just in all those people and the whole chaos, mm. and people rushing and going each way and standing around for the baggage and I couldn't remember what my suitcase looked like. I, mean, I was already feeling so defeated just at the airport. Yeah. So when we get to the Cosmo and they tell me they don't have the room ready, it's I'm like, like distraught. Just, just put me in a room. I don't care if it's on the first floor and it's looking in a closet. <laughs> Let me <laughs> I need to escape. Yeah. And so they did. They put me on like the eighth or 10th floor. It was very low, close to the street and uh, in the front of the hotel. So what's crazy is I was contemplating how to kill myself. Mm -hmm. And I was so mm -hmm. devastated that I wasn't high enough. <laughs> I'm like, I'm just going to get more jacked up. I'm not going <laughs> to fix anything here. And I know this sounds just. It ridiculous. doesn't. I've Coming been there. No. My mouth. <laughs> But you were desperate. Really, you were desperate. You were at the bottom and you're desperate. It's a horrible place. Yeah. So I'm standing outside looking and it's hot and it's like the sun's on my face. So I should be feeling happy because I came out of Buffalo in January. I was right. though. And yeah. uh, I look at this, they have these driving billboards on the Vegas Strip. And I see this, get your medical cannabis card today. Call 1-800-GET-YOUR-WEED card. A sign and from God. I was just like, and I was like, hmm, I doubt that'll help. Um, and then it comes back by again. And uh. so I'm like, what the hell? So my husband came back from a walk because he said, I literally can't stand to be around you. I have to get out mm -hmm. of this room. Wow. I'm like going to kill you if you don't kill yourself. Yeah. So I mentioned to him when he gets back, I'm like, there's this billboard that just drove by about get your weed card, you know, and he's uh -huh. going to do it. <laughs> he said do it like let's do it now let's do it <laughs> let's and do it. <laughs> okay so my husband is not an extravagant kind of guy he's like you know we take a cab we do ride share we don't Low budget learn, yeah. Yeah. like for crazy things we get down there and the cab line is like snaked all the way up to the lobby and jack says to the bell guy what can you get us quick that we can get to this place yeah yeah he goes, wow. oh you're going downtown He's like, I can give you the limo. Oh, it's like crazy money. It was like something like 80 bucks an hour or something. And, and so like it would have cost a cab probably 15. So we go to this clinic to get your card. Mm -hmm. And what's classic is I'm writing down all my medical problems with yep. 50 different drugs I'm on. I'm <laughs> writing all this stuff, but trying not to sound too jacked up so that they won't give me the medicine. So I grab the the sheet of paper from the receptionist and she's like just fill out your name and address and your drugs and then i'll get you your card i'm like okay do i see a doctor no the vital signs on the sheet were already filled in uh -huh. 
like my blood pressure was supposedly no 120 way. over 80. My pulse was 68. My respirations were like 18. Oh, they uh, were I had fudging. to put my height and weight in there. 100%. As, Ill, as oh, illegal man. as illegal can possibly be. Huh. Okay. But I am not one to judge. At this oh, point, yeah. Right? As long as it's like giving me a card and it's legit, I'm good. Yeah. So then I go then to the dispensary. I walk in, it's this beautiful display case and all these signs about different strains and different flavors and edibles and drinks and all kinds of just, it was like walking into Toys R Us oh, as a five-year-old for the first time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it was overwhelming as well, uh-huh. you know, because I didn't even have a clue what I was doing. I'm like, look, man, I've smoked joints, but I can't roll. You don't want to sound stupid. <laughs> And so I was in there for probably 45 minutes. And then my husband's like, what are you doing in there? Oh, my God. <laughs> and so I talked to um, the bud tender for probably these whole 45 minutes. And he's sort of educating me on, mm-hmm. you know, what I should do. I'm like, look, man, I suffer from headaches that have never gone away. Mm-hmm. So what he prescribed or suggested, mm-hmm. because he's not a prescriber, he's just sure. a bud tender, Um, what he suggested was like this heavy indica, high mercine strain that Mm -hmm. was beyond couch lock. It was like, um, (laughs) so what I can tell you though, is I probably spent like $200 there at the dispensary with several, a few different flavors and bought a pipe and, Uh you know, because we're on the Cosmopolitan and there's a balcony, you can smoke right there outside on the balcony. And I got, I guess, high, you could say. Um, I got off that ledge. I got Mm -hmm. uh, off that ledge. It definitely is not my jam for current use, but it took away the complete despair despair and hopelessness. Hopelessness. It gave me... Mm. It opened a window. Yeah, I mean, the headache wasn't gone by any means. Uh Uh-huh. But it wasn't like the only thing I was thinking of anymore. Mm-hmm. It wasn't, it didn't improve my cognition because what I've learned <laughs> since is certain terpenes pretty yep. much give you couch walk and others really help with your cognitive abilities for me with my brain injury anyway. Uh-huh. And so it was so interesting, cool, you know, it's how much so I came, different it yeah. is. So fast forward now, now let's say it's, we're home from vacation and mm-hmm. I'm right back to my sad. Um, yeah. I called the guy down the street, got some weed, and it was not the thing. It yeah. just, it did nothing. It did nothing. I wow. felt like I was smoking a, a grass cutter clipping. <laughs> so I just like perceived in my head this weed was this magical carpet ride, and it's really sure. not. You know, now yeah. reality sets back in, and the same pains and aches and crappy doctors and yeah. crappy experiences continued. And so then I said, Something's got to give. So Mm -hmm. I had friends in Canada Mm -hmm. and my friend ended up getting a cannabis prescription before it was legal in Canada. And I signed, we just randomly picked a uh, licensed producer, not knowing anything about any of them or strains or anything, but I'm Mm -hmm. like, it's got to be better than this crap here. So we get this one and it's called Can Trust. My friend orders three different types of cannabis, it was immediately different, just immediate. Uh But again, it was very strain related. And again, I'm like, well, why does this royal purple kush put me into complete paralysis? And yet this cheese just has a totally different effect. What did the cheese do? The cheese was like so uplifting. And all of a sudden I could talk and I could actually communicate Mm -hmm. and the headache was still there, yes, but again, it was not the, the only thing I thought of. I uh-huh. actually was playing Scrabble. <laughs> like your perception <laughs> of the headache changed. It totally. Yeah, yeah. Totally. Wow. And it wasn't any longer this horrible thing. I called uh-huh. my husband, and I'm talking normal, and he's like, what are you doing? What's going on? Why are you so happy? Uh-huh. He's like, you don't sound like yourself at all. <laughs> it's gotta be this yeah. hot. It's gotta be this weed. Like, yep. oh my God. Like, if you're noticing it across the phone lines and I'm noticing it here, well, then of course, 
this wonderful producer can trust, you can buy this strain original cheese several times, but then they run out of it. And then they don't yeah, it again. That sucks. <laughs> anyway, after the cheese experience, pretty much every cannabis had to compare to cheese. Mm -hmm. Like that was my dream feeling, like always. And it did have high terpenes and limine okay. and pining, which I've learned since are my terpenes that really that works help me and medicate me. Correct. So after Cantrust, I then got my New York State medical card. How and hard I was that? Medicine. That was more challenging, but not super challenging. Okay. That was actually a legit medical experience. <laughs> yeah, that was that's the way it was in Massachusetts. Yeah, it was. It's legit. Yeah, yeah. it's legit. I mean, there's a phone number that I called to the mm -hmm. nurse practitioner that basically has been prescribing cannabis since the medical program started. Mm -hmm. The problem with New York State cannabis is it's not whole plant medicine. Vaping is the closest thing you can get to smoking. Now, how and I don't mean vaping I don't even, flour. Yeah. Tinctures and oils. And because wow. of my prior health issues, I don't absorb fat soluble things. So mm -hmm. any edibles, tinctures, anything doesn't that work. requires digestion does not work. Oh, that at all. sucks. <laughs> and the expense, okay, for a 0. 0.3 ml, not even a half a gram cartridge, it's $86. Completely doesn't work. Oh it's, my goodness. It's isolate. So it's not full plant. Right, There's no terpenes. Right. There's no. It's just a one shot. Straight one shot. And if that helps people. Great. Awesome. Right. But yeah. But it you, did not help yeah, me. Yeah. <laughs> CBD. You. I have tried pills, tinctures, vapes, and honestly, CBD by itself actually gives me a headache. Interesting. But I mean, I found that when I smoked it, which seemed to be the only method I was going to, mm -hmm. you know, be able to function with it, I noticed just more of a headache. I didn't notice it helping me. And people have told me if you use CBD flour mixed in with your regular flour, mm -hmm. that will have a more of an entourage synergistic effect. Mm -hmm. So I find I need high THC. And a lot yeah. of people are poo poo on I THC. Know. Well, and you know, especially sort of dealing silly. with parents, you know, like trying to help parents, you know, people freak out over THC and it's just, the, we have these words that we apply to these, these feelings that have somehow become labeled as good and bad. And it really is stupid. This is my rant, but, but it's like our Puritan history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, go on. The um, interesting thing was, is Charlotte's Web, I mean, everybody knows Stanley Brothers and Charlotte's Web. Yep. I learned that it wasn't always just CBD. The original formula had the actual THC in it. So Did learning it. that from behind the scenes, yes, I had no idea. However, through my amazing network of connections, I have found some God. really smart people who personally know the Stanley Brothers and their child was on it. And I uh -huh. learned the whole story behind it. And there's so much to this plant that people just don't realize. I know. So since my injury, one of the things that I've learned more than anything is about living in the moment. My life changed in a second, and I can't go back and write a new ending, but I sure can start now and change how it ends. When I yeah. look back and I think how sad and horrible I felt, and so many people are the same way, and they have no hope. They haven't. You know, if they tried cannabis, they haven't given it a full on. Yeah. Try. And it um, does take some, it takes some, like I say, it takes, there's a learning curve. There really is. If it doesn't work the first time, there's, you shouldn't give up. A hundred percent. But having someone that has patience to be, now, had I not had that dramatic experience between Nevada and Canada and seeing that, wow, there really is other medicine out here that might yeah. work. And maybe there really is something to this cannabis stuff. And but how do you find out? And, you know, you had to buy large quantities of like minimum of five gram quantities. So if Oof. that particular strain didn't work for you, well, you pretty You're much wasted kind of 60, 80 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> you know, now I've learned to mix the things not as effective with things that are effective. But back then, you know, again, just the trial and error. And sure. so living in the moment and actually feeling life for what it is, I find if I look behind me all the time, all I do is create more depression. Mm. If I look ahead continuously, all it is is anxious. Yeah. 
-hmm. Like, am I going to be good enough? Am I going to do this right? Is it okay? But I figure if I just focus right now on my talk with Jill and live through that and not have any expectations or any false hopes or anything, just enjoy the conversation. I find it makes such a big difference. Being present. And buddy, I am the very last person in the world that would ever have said this four years ago. Wow, that's interesting. It I like stopped you in your tracks and kind of like made, held you hostage to having to really like deal in some ways with your inner with reality, with yeah, life and with, life. with who you are mm-hmm. and, and realize, you know, it's not about you anymore. It's about sharing the message mm-hmm. and giving other people hope. So what are you doing you know, now? What I do now is. I just started sharing my story. I sent it to Mike and uh, I have a very good friend, Rochelle Gordon, who uh, is a writer for Financial Cannabis News. Uh And she kind of helped me lose some of the ramble and (laughs) make my story more concise. And then I sent it to Mike and I said, I don't know, do you think this is worth having more exposure? Do you Mm -hmm. think people would want to hear about this? You know, I'm not trying to be famous in any way, shape, or form. I'm just trying to promote awareness. Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. This is really good. And so he then published one and then published the second one. And I'm so grateful for humans like that. And if it wasn't for Rochelle, you know, just kind of nudging me and getting me off my butt, you know, my biggest frustration has been the whole medical cannabis access here in New York State. So how do you do it? Legitimately, I am challenged for real cannabis Um, here in the state. I've considered moving to Nevada. Mm -hmm. I've tried to move to Canada. Did? Yes. I'm too old. I consider it like every day. Oh, really? I'm probably too old. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I'm older than you. Yeah. so. So what's interesting is my Canada cannabis journey, I get a message show up on my LinkedIn. Now, originally when I was on LinkedIn, I had like 118 contacts or something, Mm -hmm. some people from the casino, some people from Buffalo, Sure, nothing major. I started going on LinkedIn and learning about cannabis and learning about the different Canadian cannabis companies. And people started friending me and requesting for, you know, connection requests. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden I've grown now to like 25,000 contacts. Wow. And, um, People share my story all over the place in different Facebook groups. And I've got to be honest, Jill, I am not a social media expert. So I don't realize a lot of times who's sharing what or how they're sharing it. And, you know, I'm just not that girl. But, like, I get more connection requests all the time. So it's just crazy. So I did my first brain injury talk back in, say, February of Whatever the hell. Uh, that's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Uh, uh-huh. <laughs> I do this talk, and when I'm there, they're asking me all these questions like, what dose do you use? How much do you use each time? I'm like, look, I just smoke a lot, like a whole lot. <laughs> when one ends, I pretty much am on to the next. <laughs> right. So, uh, forget all the quantifying. Uh, Come on. But yeah, right. I know they decide. They, <laughs> they want details, right? Yes, they want to know exactly the effects. and. And I've tried to follow some of those apps that, you know, you can track your strain and track Uh your effectiveness and all this stuff. But with all the accumulation of my symptoms, it's very difficult to just pick one thing and then track that strain all the way through. It's just incredible. I have literally tried well over 400 strains. Do you write them down? (laughs) Oh, yeah. I did. But now it's to the point where I know and understand sort of the genetics of the parent of the strain I have. The cheese? Did so you? As long as I, yeah, like, so I can say a super lemon haze, I know is from like silver haze, and silver haze super is pretty haze. effective in my, yeah, that's like part of my chirp profile. Really? That worked for me. So just kind of knowing the background of the, you know, I mean, I live on wine and learn about its mm-hmm. terpenes. And, and again, just because it says it's, super lemon haze from dispensary A and then you go to dispensary B and it's super lemon haze doesn't mean it's the same oh I know (laughs) I know this 
I mean, legit. You really and, like uh, I go and ask the people in the in the dispensary for recommendations because they know you know what what they're growing there or well for the most part. Well, you're in Mass, so you've got at least the luxury of. Oh yeah, I mean, it's know, a huge COA. luxury. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's expensive, but yep. you've got tested quality cannabis. Oh, it's so good, I've tried, too. I've tried Illinois cannabis. I've tried PA's medical cannabis. I've tried uh, Michigan's cannabis. Mm -hmm. I've tried Massachusetts cannabis. <laughs> I, I got to tell you some great books that I've read. The Woman's yes. Guide to Cannabis by Nikki Furrer. That's a great starting book for when you're okay. trying to learn Woman's what cannabis. cannabis even is. Mm -hmm. The Woman's Guide to Cannabis, Nikki Furrer, F-U-R-R-E-R. -R -R. That was the very first book I actually was able to read with my brain injury. Uh -huh. It's very large print, easy yeah. to understand. But the very best book has been by far the Medical Cannabis Primer Medical uh, by cannabis, Ruth Fisher. Yes. She is next level with her knowledge and understanding of the plant and the book it's like a workbook it's just so easily I can't wait to get laid that. out it is the very best book and like i said i can't read anymore i mean i <sighs> used to read novel after novel yeah. after a novel so for me to recommend a book with a tbi <laughs> is, yeah but you know if nothing else since this injury i've learned so many things about chronic illness and how how much is misunderstood about it. Mm -hmm. And just because somebody doesn't have a broken leg or isn't in a wheelchair, doesn't mean they're not disabled. It doesn't mean that they're not challenged in some way. If I have a, you know, use my parking sticker, it's usually when it's icy out and I'm at a huge risk, fall risk. So I still suffer with dizziness and balance issues mm -hmm. and depth perception issues. I feel guilty though. <laughs> as a person using that sometimes and i shouldn't, you shouldn't. but i do but i know but, why you do yeah. i it's you know it's uh tsc that like i said there's a range of impacts so you know what looks really like typical like outward appearance you know nothing really odd and then there's an assumption you know there's an assumption made that they're you're functioning at a certain level when you know there's all kinds of challenges. Yeah. So yeah, I get, I get exactly. it. That's what I'm saying. And the I handicap thing, yeah. You're gonna get judged. Thing. I mean, I'm total judgment. Yeah, and I, people are can be just vicious. I mean, it's almost like you feel bully, bullied like you were in grade school sometimes. Oh, <laughs> I mean, serious. No, I hear you. It. Yeah, I bet. I mean, I've had old had women to like kind of really give me the eye you, and, Really? <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. yeah. And and like, I don't have a cane. I walk unassisted. Uh -huh. Doesn't mean I shouldn't, but I don't. To me, I just try and be me, right? And yep. I don't try and take advantage of systems. I don't try and, you know, hurt anyone or mm -hmm. do anything wrong. I just have really become more human with this injury. Mm. And I That's mean, I was a nurse and I didn't understand TBI. I didn't understand, yeah, it's a hit on the head. Big deal. You get right. over it. Look you at the hockey back. players. Look yeah. at the football players. No, yeah. it's not that simple. And since my third TBI, the game changer, I've had three more. No, now, what's really? very interesting. Oh, yeah. The pictures in Mike's article, the ones that show that horrific picture of me with the, with the black and blue, that was my. Okay, fourth yes, head I injury. remember that. Okay. Yeah, the fourth head injury happened, losing my balance. I cracked my head on a. Uh, glass countertop snack bar. Okay. And I went to Canada emergency room, Kingston General Hospital. And when anyone talks about our shitty medical system, <laughs> it yeah. is not. I'm telling you, I was thrown into a broom closet. There was no neuro exam. I should have for sure had imaging because it, it was broken open. And the note that this doctor quote wrote completely made no sense. Really? It was like she didn't even read her dictation back. It was like horrible. And wow. I suffered so much less with that significant blow compared to the third one. And okay. I genuinely believe it's it was because the cannabis. I had cannabis on yeah. board. Mm -hmm. Right away. I genuinely believe that. The last two I've had, 
I've literally had next to no lasting effects. I mean, it's weird. It's all, I'm right back to my baseline of the third brain injury. That's kind of like the new day. But I'm telling you, the last two and the last one I had, the sixth one, I was walking into University of Buffalo. This Dr. Metzler, who is the cannabis expert in Western New York, was speaking on traumatic brain injury and cannabis. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I was interested. No, in we had you to say. Fa- Oh, gosh. I don't know. Really I, was, I was walking into that, and I face planted at a oh. thousand miles an hour. And uh, I mean, I had so much image in that day. I'm probably still glow. Everything got jacked up from my knee to my face, to oh. my neck, to my head. It was just insane. So I didn't get to see Dr. Meshler that day, but he sure knows me now. But I, it's really interesting, the awareness that I kind of have stirred up. I mean, I've gone to Albany on a lobbying day and that's really hard on me. I All can imagine. And yeah. Not medicating and just trying to keep everything straight. And mm-hmm. and there's a lot of fighting that goes on. And I'm just a very positive person. And I want to find a way to get things done, not mm-hmm. argue about what's yeah, me happened too. in the past. Yeah, I, I hear you. Let's, <laughs> so yeah. it's very challenging I for bet. me to go to those. And, and I mean, I get people have been wronged by the war on drugs. And I get people want home grow. And I understand but damn it, I need real medicine. Yeah. I just want real quality plant medicine. That to me is the most fundamental thing before we start focusing on adult use and going crazy with adult use. Let's work on our medical program. For yeah. patients. And I believe with adult use, that will help the medical patients, at least in my humble opinion, because I believe then the tax revenue will come in that they're looking for and we'll have more choices. Mm-hmm. But our government is pretty backward. What? Oh, <laughs> I New know. Not to be negative, but someone just a, told me that Cuomo said he was going to legalize it in 2020. Yeah. Sweetheart, he said that in 2019. I was part of it. I was there, really? <laughs> and and it just fell apart. And so the the New York City senators and people there are just avidly against it in so many you ways. Think it's, like uh, Westchester County. Yeah, it's was, all big pharma. That's what I was going to say. big pharma. It's unfortunately all about the money. They don't get excited. I mean, when I saw the sales for Illinois, I was just, I'm in awe. Like, why does New York State in two days not want $11 million? Just curious. Yeah. And it's I got, mean, yeah. I, right. In two days. I don't know, Nikki. Or five it's... days. Five days. Five days. It was five days for the $11 million. But the point is, they're running yeah. out of cannabis. <laughs> and they're doing it right. So. Yeah, I guess my mission now is just to continue to spread the word mm-hmm. about cannabis. And when I went to Las Vegas in 2018, I really felt the ultimate game changer strain that mm-hmm. took over cheese. Oh, really? Um, and it's oh cool. yeah, this company is called Shango. I believe they're in Oregon, uh, Washington, and Nevada. And their strain, A Dub has worked better for me than anything. I, again, just am looking for medicine that works. It's not about representing a company or a one single product. It's about educating the masses and teaching them about the different things to look for when mm-hmm. they're buying cannabis. Mm-hmm. I would love to open a cannabis friendly resort. And Oh, you'd be you know, great at that. I would be great at it, but well, every this- time I've tried to get off the first floor, of it, it basically gets shut down. Oh, it gets man. shut down because of regulations and consumption issues. And I don't want to move to California. I, I hear you. I know I couldn't handle that. But I really love Canada. And I don't mind living in New York. I just... I you just want to have it. Yes, and it's exactly. You don't want life. to have to move. It's quality of life. Absolutely. And I'm just excited for the future. I don't know what it holds. I genuinely believe what's meant to be is going to shake out. So I will say this. Uh, So many people have impacted my journey with the traumatic brain injury uh, and cannabis. Mm -hmm. And I actually discovered social media by accident because of my TBI. Um, Yes, I was on Facebook and LinkedIn, but it wasn't a big uh, following or uh-huh. big obsession of mine. Uh-huh. So um, there were so many TBI groups out there and cannabis groups. Uh-huh. Uh, there's so many stories that have impacted my 
life and my journey personally. Um, when I first, you know, was starting out on social media, Sabrina Ramkilawan was one of the first professionals in the cannabis industry that I met. Okay. Um, I've learned from her, and her network is just amazing. It's been everything from research to, you know, medical care to wow. just meeting her whole network has been such an eye-opener. Kate Zong of the Lou Rubo Cleveland Clinic in Las Vegas has just been a huge impact and wealth of knowledge and experience that, you know, I've learned so much from her. There's so many people out there sharing my story from you, Jill, to Bobby Rodrigo, to Mike Robinson, Rochelle Gordon, Jeff Brown, James Durham, local advocate groups here, Western New York Normal. There have been so many actual um, groups that have impacted me, as CTE groups, Amy's TBI tribe, Think Concussions. I'm actually a moderator on the uh, New York medical cannabis community, and I've learned so much really? from the people there. Yeah. Huh. Uh, Tanya San, uh, Kristen Yoder, and probably the biggest, best influence that I've had in the cannabis industry has been learning about Kyle Turley and the struggles of the NFL players. Huh. Um, their journey is just unbelievable, and they're great people. Um, I haven't personally met Kyle, but I've spoken with him on the phone. He has a great CBD product out there that's water-soluble that I actually found relief with. The folks at Shango do a great job as far as products that really seem to help me. I've what was the name them. of, yeah, I wanted that because I, I'm on some boards, and people sometimes mention that those things, and I like to have resources. Sure. Um, Shango has two strains for me particularly that work phenomenal. Okay. Uh, A-dub, A-dub, A-D-U-B, uh-huh. and Sticky B. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I didn't name them. I'm just... <laughs> Shango's in uh, several states, and I just would do anything to be in one of their states because I would have quality medicine uh, that yeah. I could access all the time mm-hmm. instead of just when I go to Nevada or uh, Oregon or Washington State. That's where they are now. But it's such a crime that I can't utilize my medicine. It really is. It works so good. And, you know, the Canadian cannabis companies, you know, I'm learning more about them each day. And, you know, I've met just so many powerful, awesome people on the Canadian side and the U.S. side. So I That's you awesome. know, a- appreciate your time and appreciate you taking the time to share my story. It's been my pleasure. Without you, I don't know. No one would know the story. <laughs> Letter pass. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for listening to our podcast, TSC Talks. Please feel free to navigate to our website, www.tsctalks.com. Please try to support us, make a contribution, say a prayer, leave a review. Tell us you love us, you hate us, but thanks for tuning in. Stay tuned for more.